Well, welcome everybody for the third uh, session of this meeting on synthetic biology. Uh, so I'm the chairperson of the, of the third uh, session. Actually, I know very few people here because I myself, I'm, I'm neither a mathematician nor a biologist in the, in the strict sense. Actually, I'm, I am uh, an evolutionary biologist and it's actually it was already a great pleasure to hear that evolution pops up in some of the discussions before. So I'll... Um, <coughs> um, I'll use the few minutes that I can use as the chairperson of this session to, exp to try to explain to you why synthetic biology could be interested, interesting for, um, for also for people in my background, that is ecology and evolutionary biology. Oh, sorry, is that better? Okay, so I'm going to try to, going to explain how, wh why uh, synthetic biology can be interesting for, uh, also for people in my area of evolutionary biologists. So, well, so we are now here on, uh, on a meeting on uh, synthetic biology. So, well, very f most people think of it in terms of, uh, uh, of Frankensteinian science. Uh, so actually, uh, one of them, this is an, an image of a, a salamander larvae which, has, which they gave another eye. So it's, it's not evolutionary, but it's synthetic. It's, they've, they've implanted another eye. And these salamanders can actually do very well with it. The other thing is, is real, but it's, uh, it's not science, it's art. It's an artist from Australia, Australia who has implanted an ear in his arm, and he wants uh, actually to put a microphone in it to, to do some art uh, things. But <coughs> so for most people, when, when, you disc when, you say, when you talk about synthetic biology, that's what they tend to think about. We are sort of scientists, uh, mad scientists, uh, uh, interfering with things that they uh, shouldn't interfere with. But anyway. Um, I think that the whole aim of this meeting is to show that it's actually a, it's a, it's a respective, a respectable science, and that we can actually uh, uh, use it for many ways. Of course, we have we have had already an engineering uh, point of view where we can actually use all sorts of insights to design, uh, modify uh, natural systems in order to do things that we want them to do. Um, I want to stress here that we actually also can use, we could use synthetic biology to gain insight in, uh, in how things uh, are. So I'm an evolutionary biologist, and much of my day-to-day -day work is, is to, to deal with mathematical models that try to predict the outcome of evolution. And it turns out that most of this, uh, of, uh, much of this uh, rests on hypotheses that we make about trade-offs between traits that individuals have. And the, the oldest examples actually date from the 60s of the previous century, where uh, people worked out, were, were asking themselves what makes that some organisms are generalists that live in, in, a, in, a, in the whole environment, whereas other uh, organisms are specialists, they specialize on spe special types uh, of environments. And it turns out that the end result uh, depends on uh, basically what is possible for the organism. If you, you can have a, a now I have to try to find the pointer when it. Oh, sorry. <coughs> so you can have two and two types of environments, and you can measure their fitness, the fitness, the, the degree of adapt adaptedness to these to, to these different types of environments, and you can sort of make a line where the <coughs> all the maximum fitnesses that the individual is is able to attain. So it can it can choose a point somewhere on this line, and it's this trade-off shape that determines uh, what, what basically what's possible for this organism. Well, it turns out that the end result, the evolutionary end result, depends very much on the shape of this line. So here in this case, you can have a shape which is con uh, concave, but you can also have a shape which is more convex. And it turns out that the end result, the evolutionary end result, is here and sort of uh, represented by the blue dot, is, is a generalist population if the co if the if this uh, trade-off shape is uh, convex, whereas uh, you get two specializing populations if the trade-off shape is, uh, uh, is concave. So this, is, this gives us an insight, and as is the evolutionary biologist, this gives us an insight in what might be the conditions that favor specialization of organisms. But now you want to test this kind of uh, 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 prediction. And then you go into the field, my colleagues go into the field, and they say, well, let's go and try to see what is the shape of this, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, trade-off function. Well, if you do this, this is typically what you get. 
either you have one single population and you get a, a sort of a cloud around the single population of, of uh, journalists, but it's very difficult to gain insight in uh, what precisely is uh, determines the shape. Is this is this indicative of a convex shape or a uh, con con concave? And similarly for um, for the, the concave, in, in this case you have two set distinct populations, and we have actually very little information about what's, what might be the, 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 the trade-off shape in between. Now, people have already started doing things like uh, genetic engineering to gain insights in this, uh, this kind of question. And you can take a bacterium and you can, you can tinker with, uh, with its basic uh, physiology. Uh, I don't know the precise details, but it, it, mean, it mean, means that if you interfere with the production of, of the expression of different genes, you can switch on different types of, uh, of uh, responses uh, in, an, in the bacterium. I think this is E. coli. And uh, by, by interfering with this, you can actually sort of make, uh, make the organism, you can create many different strains where, you sort of, uh, where, where the expression levels of these, of these genes are modified. And you can quite neatly trade, trace out the shape of these trade-off functions. So I think uh, synthetic biology could be used to, to get this even a step further and to get us, make us address questions like in biology, evolutionary biology, what is actually possible? So this is uh, one of the questions I think that we should add to this list that, that Victor already uh, uh, wrote on the blackboard uh, earlier on. And then, if we know what is possible, we also have to work out what actually what is, uh, why it's in the, it isn't there already. And I think this is also a question that arose more or less in, uh, during the discussion earlier today. So I think this is in a very, uh, very short outline of why uh, synthetic biology could be very, uh, of interest for, for people in my area, uh, evolutionary biology. So, and, uh, but it, it really means that we should address questions like uh, uh, dealing with evolution. So uh, my session, uh, I'm chairing this session actually also the, because of the chairperson of, the, uh, of tomorrow is, uh, couldn't come, so I will chair be chairing the next morning as well. Uh, my session, of this session, these two sessions continue on the theme of what, what you can do if you change uh, the genetic code. Uh, so, and there's actually, in evolutionary biology, there's, a, there's a, a related question that pops up all over the place, and that's actually why actually do do organisms use a common code? This is, uh, if you think about it, it's, it's not so obvious at all. Of course, we have seen uh, the, the dogma, the famous dogma already a couple of times today, which says, well, you have DNA and then uh, everything f follows from this. But actually, lots and lots of research nowadays shows that this, this dogma is not so uh, infallible as it, all, as it has seen. As the, of course, we know about uh, re reverse transcriptase for a long time, but nowadays, lots of genetic information is actually not coded in DNA, but in epigenes, so there are modifications, short-term modifications of DNA, and these have a much more fluid way of encoding and, uh, information. And uh, so it really means that uh, sort of genes are not so uh, universal as is often uh, uh, thought. And <coughs> I stumbled on a question like this already a long time ago when we were uh, uh <coughs> when we were uh, doing a model on the evolution of uh, of information use uh, in a population, and it turns out that you have a system will evolve to use a single way of encoding information only if the members of this population are not, not too much in conflict. If, uh, if, the, if the members of this of a population are uh, in conflict, actually what you, what you have is that the whole thing becomes unstable and you get uh, cyclic evolution or chaotic evolution where you have uh, different types of encoding uh, uh, get evolved. And uh, in human populations, you can already see this, that well, here we, can, we, we are all very nice people, so we, we don't have much conflict here, so we can, we can manage all by speaking English. But if you go to the market or some other economically important uh, area, you will, you will discover that people tend to speak in codes where they try to convey some of the information to, uh, if they try to address, send information only to, to particular people and not allow everybody to hear. So uh, in this case, uh, uh, common code is, uh, it will not evolve. And actually, and the, there are some examples in biology where the common code is actually uh, aborted, for instance, where uh, populations interact with uh, parasites uh, uh, and viruses and things. So and then uh, you can actually arrive at the situation where the whole uh, information use uh, breaks down. So and there's the second case where we <laughs> So we were, we were talking, discussing standards uh, earlier on, 
Actually, I think there should be also a reason. Uh, we should also be aware that there's an advantage of, ha of having a standard, but it's also uh, it can also be a, a, an inconvenience. But we, you always have to be uh, to worry about where you are on the on the on the. Uh, <coughs> Uh, you always have to, to to worry about the costs and benefits of of, of, of uh, standardizing and uh, and, and uh, efficient communication. Okay, so I'll, uh, that was actually what I, all I had to say today. So I'll now uh, leave the floor to Floyd Romsberg, who is all going to talk about uh, semi-synthetic organisms. If I'm correct. Right.